Hmm. It's going to be recording now. Okay, perfect. Yeah, let me know when you want me to dive in. Yeah, so everybody, I've presented uh, the three speakers in the very beginning, but for everyone who missed it, Jordan is an associate professor in the Missouri State University. Um, he is the leader of HubLab, Humans Understanding Behavior. Um, he and his colleagues have been developing uh, relational density theory, which is an extension of relational frame theory. We've seen uh, some introductions of it uh, over the, the poster's presentation. So uh, without any further ado, let's just move on to Jordan's talk. OK, perfect. Well, hey, thank you so much for the invite. And thank you so much to everybody who is making the time and space, either in person or virtually, to listen to me talk about this relational density theory thing. Um, the title of my presentation today carries two meanings. In one sense, I'm going to be explaining both the meaning of and the essence of relational density theory. It's a new concept in our field that we've been developing over the past three years since the first publication in 2020, based on initial work on my dissertation that I was fortunate enough to have Dr. Barnes Holmes on my committee at that time. In another sense, the talk will also explore how the meaning and essence contained in relational framing can influence mental health and therefore how behavior analysts might uniquely contribute in this space. So I want to start by um, with some acknowledgments. The first is, although I'm presenting this work today, it's not only my work. It's the collective work of many people, including other scientists and practitioners who we work closely with. I want to especially acknowledge my research lab for their work. Uh, current lab members are listed here and several other incoming lab members presented during the poster session today. Second, conflicts and funding sources. We work with a number of behavioral service providers in our university to generate funding opportunities for student researchers to support this work and have obtained seed grants from ACBS. As far as book royalty go, royalties go, if anyone's looking to get paid significantly less per hour than they currently are, um, consider writing a book. And so those books are listed here as well. Today we're going to talk about the concepts of meaning and the, and the transcendental concepts of essence, then overview relational density theory and why it's needed. We'll apply the basic concepts to issues of mental health, then work through a group example together about midway because 90 minutes is a long time, and then we'll conclude by talking about the role of culture on mental health challenges experienced in the United States and throughout the world. We make sense of our world through symbols and language. In the field of semiotics, semantics are the meaning that symbols carry. In the United States, this symbol means something like rock on, a derivative of devilish symbolism in rock and roll music. However, in some Mediterranean and Latin countries, this is used as a sign to tell someone that their spouse is cheating on them. If you were to walk into a Dutch supermarket, you might see this sign which roughly translates to mommy, I want this one, this one, this one. Of course, meaning can change over time. For example, the happy poop emoji, which has an overwhelming number of appropriate uses today, trust me, originally conveyed good luck in Japan where emojis themselves originated. But some meanings never change. For example, Colgate, a toothpaste brand, launched a frozen beef lasagna in the 1980s. I don't know about you all, but all I can imagine when I look at this picture is lasagna that tastes like toothpaste. The subfield of behavior analysis, including contextual behavioral science, has always been a science of meaning. The idea of social validity asks the question, is behavior change meaningful? Can we become a science that helps others to find greater meaning and purpose in their lives? However, that shows up to find meaning in joy, to find meaning in suffering. The purpose of behavior analysis is not in any way to askew our humanity, but to discover it more fully and more completely, to experience it transcendentally and to evolve it in meaningful ways. And in behavior analysis, there has been a huge emphasis on exploring human language. 
an intervention for autistic and other neurodivergent learners, building language through verbal operant and relational training. In behavior therapies like acceptance and commitment therapy, changing the way a person interacts with their world through language, often through some combination of conversation, experiential learning, guided by analogy and metaphor, operating under the assumption that experience can somehow be guided by the meaning that language itself carries. Behavior analysis can be considered a pragmatic science. For pragmatic philosophers like William James, John Dewey, Jane Addams, meaning is contrived to solve problems. For example, this is a car. It's one example of a near infinite selection of cars, but exactly what makes it a car? Is it the color red? Is it the windshield? Well, this is also a car. It's a 1921 Layette Helica, or a propeller car. Not the greatest invention. The propeller on the front made it really difficult to see, which was a disaster for pedestrians, an even worse disaster if you're a pigeon. But the common structural element is that these two things both contain four tires, so perhaps it's four tires that make it a car. But wait, this is also a car, or at least a concept of a car by Volkswagen called a hover car, designed with electromagnetic highways in mind. The point is, a car is not defined by its features, rather by what it does. Its meaning is rooted explicitly in its utility. What it refers to evolves as the object itself evolves, as the context around it changes. Essentially, meaning exists to solve new problems and new challenges. This assumption was inherent in Skinner's verbal behavior theory that assumes meaning was established when the behavior of the speaker was reinforced by the actions of a listener who had been trained at one point in time to differentially reinforce this behavior in some specific way. Described as Skinner did and still assumed within modern accounts of relational frame theory, meaning is culturally inherited. It is a system through which language is propagated over time. Meaning is stored generationally for better or worse. The listener, for example, might be a parent who reinforces and shapes the verbal repertoire or meaning and understanding of the speaker, their child, who in their time grows up to become the listener, who reinforces and shapes the repertoire of the speaker, who in their time becomes the listener to shape the repertoire of the next generation. Through this process, simple and complex, even existential meaning, is passed along and contained within culture. The same experiences by two people, let alone two people from vastly different cultures, will be understood fundamentally differently based on this cultural selection mechanism, symbolic selection or symbotype. And meaning can even change or transform over time, even in a relatively short time. For example, in a majority Western, westernized culture of the past, to aspire to slay in this presentation would pronounce a desire to harm the audience in some way. However, due to intersectional spread, primarily through Black, Latin, and gay cultures, and specifically within drag scenes, slay portrays a very different meaning today. Metaphorically, that one is flawlessly killing it, an expression of meaning culturally propagated in part by Beyonce in 2016 in the popular song, Formation, um, more than just slang, culture and diversity give even greater richness and meaning to relatively common expressions and experiences. Relational frame theory um, extends this account considerably. This image and taxonomy represents a common approach to RFT that is summarized in a book we are in the editing phases of, attempting to provide a more complete and updated account of RFT that incorporates contemporary models and findings, including Dr. Burns Holmes's hyperdimensional and multi level model, as well as relational density theory. In its most basic form, relational frame theory assumes that meaning is not always directly reinforced by a listener. Sometimes it is. Other times, the listener themselves is abstracting meaning as an observer. Oftentimes, meaning is derived. For example, given knowledge that Jessica is older than Bob and younger than Tom, we might derive that Bob is younger than Tom and Tom is older than Bob. This can be expressed in technical notation, as in the context of age. We know the relationship between Jessica and Bob and Jessica and Tom, and therefore can derive the relationship between Bob and Tom.
However, age is not likely the only way that these three people can be related. Perhaps in the context of speed, Jessica is faster than Bob and Bob is faster than Tom. If so, then we might derive that Jessica is also faster than Tom and Tom is slower than Jessica. These are just two examples of a myriad of ways that these three people or stimulus events can be responded to relationally. And the type of relation that has the most utility or meaning also varies moment to moment in context. So we can enter this into a three or four term contingency that behavior analysts already operate and was first conceptualized by Skinner and expanded considerably since. In this case, the relational frames are contained as part of a relational learning history. Information that has been contacted in the past and can be recombined in near infinite ways. This learning history influences the control of discriminative stimuli, motivating operations, reinforcers and punishers on the behavioral response that may be of interest, in our case, mental health. For example, if Jessica is the fastest and Tom is the oldest, then in the context of competing in a track and field race might occasion selecting Jessica to perform the task. Winning the race becomes part of the relational learning history by strengthening this relationship and increasing the probability of choosing Jessica in the future. On the other hand, if two parents are going on a date for the evening, an MO that increases the reinforcing value of finding a babysitter that evening, then selecting Tom might be the logical choice since he is the oldest. The functional context in this case selects for the most logical relational dimension in the moment. Relational learning is not an all or nothing phenomena. It's a generalized operant that grows in complexity along with experience, moving from relatively simple forms of relational responding in childhood to vastly complex and interdependent relational repertoires. Thus, meaning itself is a transformational process. As language emerges, so too does meaning. From the relatively simple meaning of our childhood to the complex meaning of us here together in our worlds today. We conducted a study just this year that has the potential to model this emergence by doing a cross-sectional analysis of the peak comprehensive assessment or the PCA. We conducted the assessment with just over 100 autistic learners. There are 344 items in the assessment, so we analyzed over 34,400 pieces of data using something called a principal component analysis, also called a PCA. So we did a PCA of the PCA. By doing so, we can see how each of the different ways that we use language emerge relative to one another over time. That is, we can see the interdependency of the various elements that comprise human language and cognition. For those... For those less familiar with PEAK, um, I made a table to help visualize the types of programs we see in the curriculum. Green items are directly trained items. Red items are generalization of the direct training content. Both of these two things are based on a Skinnerian verbal operant theory that relies heavily on direct reinforcement learning and formal similarity between stimulus events. Blue refers to stimulus equivalence items or early frames of coordination, and yellow are relational framing items across multiple frame families. Level one items are simpler versions of these operands denoted by a circle. Squares are a bit more complex, diamonds even more complex, and then triangles are the most complex items found in that domain. So how do these all go together? Well, first we have to get some arbitrary stats out of the way. This is called a scree plot. It basically says how many factors or clusters are in our model. It appears to be a three factor model, but kind of, it's highly interdependent. The eigenvalues don't approach or go below that, that one value. So it's not as if we have three independent clusters of this languaging event, it's highly interdependent. But we know that three could give us a provisionally workable model because of where the elbow starts to form in the plot. Now, this is not inherently interesting, but what it does mean is that we can graph the emergence of complex language in three dimensions. And here is what we get. The axes are arbitrary, and it's the relative distribution of each element within the space 
relative to each other element that matters. To help visualize, imagine a learner just beginning to explore their language development. They would start here with elementary verbal operands built primarily through direct reinforcement. Early in this development, they would start to show simple forms of generalization. And then you would start to see elements of reflexivity and symmetry showing up in the repertoire. All of these interdependent and interconnecting. The formation of reflexivity and symmetry making it more likely that they're going to learn through direct reinforcement learning as well as generalize that learning. And then we start to see transitivity and equivalence show up in the space along with those other relational frame families from relatively simple to incredibly complex forms of relational framing, ultimately transforming the function of their world and all that it entails. To me, the graph looks kind of like a dragon, which is pretty cool. To my knowledge, this is the first glimpse of into the emergence of relational behavior viewed through this lens. And so you guys are some of the first people in the world to see these data. So what are we doing when we start to integrate verbal behavior and relational training into something like ABA programming? We're introducing new ways to view and perceive the world with greater meaning and deeper understanding. What is most critical for us today is the interdependency of verbal relational behavior with other forms of verbal relational behavior. Now, this idea that the elements that comprise language and cognition may be highly interconnected and operate in nonlinear ways is not necessarily new or novel. It's been in the air for a very long time. Cantor extended on the field theories of Albert Einstein and also the pragmatic theories of John Dewey to account for psychological interbehavior. That is, that psychological behavior is so complex that it cannot be easily reduced to its elemental parts. Dr. Barnes Holmes and colleagues propose that RFT may be more of a relational field than separate relational frames. That is, there is no singular relation or set of relations that constitute a relational response. It is the sum of the various interacting elements that comprise complex framing systems that vary across dimensions and levels, producing equally interdependent units of analysis that includes acts of relating, orienting, and evoking in a context. Results reported in the IRAP and the taxonomy described in the HTML were hugely inspirational in the development of relational density theory that attempts to evaluate the interdependent interaction of relational framing events quantitatively, describing higher order relational properties such as relational volume, density, and mass. When we start to talk about something like a relational field, we necessarily stumble into areas of discourse that have been operating for decades in philosophy and science, which are themselves sophisticated language systems from which to extract meaning and to achieve understanding. Kant's critique of pure reason challenged Descartes' idealism, positing that knowledge is gained from the outside in, much like Skinner's account and relational frame theory. Philosophers extending from Kant delineated between deductive logic that very much resembles RFT models like I just described and transcendental logic that moves beyond meaning to discussions of essence, which essentially proposes that no singular element of a thing, X, is necessary for X to be true because X is an aggregate of the various elements that X entails. For Santayana, the essence of a thing is simply everything about it, independent of its existence. Essence is whatness as distinct from thatness. Essence is the meaning that persists even when the specific elements erode or decay. Skinner alluded to the essence of learning in his quote, education is what survives when what has been learned has been forgotten. It is the essence of the thing that remains. Or from an RFT perspective, it's the space that exists between the relations.
And this idea of essence has remained a fixture in contemporary philosophy, perhaps most notably as expressed by the great philosopher scientist Joey and Chandler from Friends, who said that the cushion is, in fact, the essence of the chair, if anybody's seen that episode. The broad point is that moving from the simple, straightforward meaning of things to the broad, essential meaning of things requires updating and refining our current relational frame theories. And I'll show you why. The RFT that I just described is relatively simple and relatively straightforward. There's a lot of new terms to unpack that can be intimidating for people, but, but broadly, it boils down to something like this. The problem is that the relational repertoire becomes more and more established. The possible ways that one's relational history can influence their behavioral and mental health becomes increasingly more vast and more complex. The challenge is that everything um, the challenge, sorry, the challenge that relational density theory is meant to solve is one of complexity. As long as things are simple and everything is the same as every other thing in a network, relational frames are relatively easy to work with and traditional models hold. This has been the basis of things like matrix training or equivalence based instruction. In these simple networks, we can easily determine relations that were established through direct reinforcement or instruction and those that were derived. Complexity arrives initially by the introduction of new CRELs or contextual cues. For example, A might be different from B, B might be different from C, and C might be different from A. That is, these three stimulus events are related in terms of distinction. Approaching the various relational frame families in this way is the basis of RFT and informs training programs like the Peak Relational Training Curriculum or the SMART program that have since generated a lot of evidence supporting their utility in promoting things like intelligent behavior. We can get more complex still when multiple frames interact. For example, what happens when A is similar to B and C, but not perfectly the same, nor entirely different? That is, parts of this small network are same, parts of this small network are different. We have opposing forces pulling on the network, creating differential relatedness Viewed as a dichotomy, there are both same and different relations occurring at the same time. But the question is, how similar to one another are these stimulus events? We can model this interaction geometrically by showing the space that exists between the relations. The further two stimulus events are from one another, the more distinct or dissimilar their relationship. We see this with B in relation to both A and C, where difference is much stronger than sameness. A and C are much more closely related, pulled by a learning history establishing greater coordination. For example, A might be a dog and C is a cat, while B is something random like a Ferris wheel. We can clean up our visual display by simply measuring the degree of relatedness of the three elements that includes the multiple ways in which these things can be related. We assume that everything is related to everything else in some way, and the distance in this representation shows the degree of relatedness or relational density. So we can remove the words as well to make it even cleaner. We can clean this up by simply measuring the degree of relatedness of the three elements that includes the multiple ways that they're related. But wait. Think of anything in your life that operates as a three member network. It's not there, it doesn't exist. So we can simulate it in the lab, but how much is this representing reality? And although researchers, or sorry, although research with small networks can give us information to start to conceptualize the whole, really networks may more closely resemble something like this. When we add additional relations, we too quickly arrive at what Jack Marr referred to as a mingled yarn. While we know that everything in this space is related to everything else in this space in some sort of way, some elements are the same, some elements are different. So let's go ahead and clean this up a little bit more by eliminating the lines because we don't need both space and lines to illustrate degree of relatedness. One will do. And what we're doing as we're kind of working through this is we're subtracting information. 
this information might be true at a more molecular level of analysis so that we can view relational behavior at a more molar level of analysis. That's not to say that those lower level interactions do not matter. They do. Um, and I address this in a paper on model dependent realism and level scaling of relational models. Lower level events are assumed within the analysis of higher level events. They're occurring. We're just not paying attention to them in this analysis. Just like how something like verbal mediation might, may or may not support the development of entailed relations, this could provide important information, for example, when teaching early instances of deriving, but this information becomes less and less relevant as you move into complex networks. In the same way, which elements of the network were derived or directly taught, or the contextual cues that situate each element in the geometric space as relative to other elements becomes less and less relevant the higher you go in your analysis. And this is especially important when dealing with real world relations where we might not know the learning history that produced it. Rarely will we ever. Instead, we can start to talk in more abstract higher order properties. For example, it appears we have two networks here defined in terms, the, in terms of the space between the relations. The volume of network one um, is four and the volume of network two is 12. Therefore, we can say that network two is three times the volume of network one. Volume is the number of stimulus events contained in the network. And if we're measuring in something like dimensional units using a geometric space or geospace, like in some of the posters you just saw, along two abstracted dimensions, then we can start to talk about the relative distance between any elements within a complex network. Or we can obtain a measure of relational density or the proximity of each element within the network to each other element. Not only that, but if we abstract this as two networks, we can measure the space between the center of both networks, giving us as, as, as an estimate of one way in which networks might cohere or not cohere. In this case, a coherence estimate of approximately five units separates these two networks and might give us some information about something like how likely are these two networks to merge together when contingencies shift. So again, let's remove the scale for now to clean up our visual. With these concepts of density and volume, we can start to do some really cool things. For example, in behavior momentum theory, Nevin and colleagues describe behavior properties like mass or resistance to change using Newton's models metaphorically. In the equation, a change in behavior, in this case, relational behavior or delta R, is equal to negative X or a force applied against the network like competing information or a shift in the external contingencies, a disruptor, over M, or the resistance of the behavior to change. The question, of course, is what produces M? In 2020, um, we expanded this account and suggested that mass might be a derivative of volume and density, and this is consistent with Newton's basic framework. The greater the number of relations within a network, and the stronger those relations are, the more resistant the relational network will be to change. For example, under the same contextual pressure designed to pull the stimuli B and P from their respective networks, we might see B move a lot while P only moves a little bit. Let's say you were told that P is different from L in our network. Okay, but we still have a learning history relating P to all of the other elements in the space that are essentially holding P in place. It cannot move that much because all of those other relations still remain. Because of this, we might say that P is resistant to the C rel of difference as it relates to other stimuli in the network. Essentially, it's held in space. The stimulus B, on the other hand, can move more freely because it has fewer connections holding it. Let's go even more molar. Here we have two relational networks, A and B of differing volume and density. B is higher mass than A. It has more class members, and the average space between stimuli and the network is six times less. 
not six, but it's less. Now let's add a third network X that could be ambiguously related to either network. It could go to A, it could go to B. And we might arrange an external VR contingency where reinforcement is equally available for responding to X in terms of either A or B. So how do we respond to X? Well, if we use something like gravity as a metaphor, it's more likely that X merges with which one? B, right. X may be more likely to merge with B if force or pull is exerted by the greater mass network A. In real world terms, what is occurring is that we are perceiving ambiguous events in our world that could be interpreted in multiple ways in terms of information that we already know or biases that we already hold. In cognitive psychology, this is called a schema. In our metaphor, it is as if the high mass elements of a relational learning history are exerting gravity on relational responding that operates in the present. This is exactly the outcome that was achieved initially in the study that I conducted with Mark Dixon in 2020 as part of my dissertation, and again in the study conducted by myself and Dr. Michael Clayton that proposed this as one way to approach coherence. A question, of course, is why does this happen, right? We're talking about the etiology of mental health, so we have to deal with those kinds of questions. Well, these kind of ideas are descriptive, not ontological. Ultimately, it is probably um, all coming back to reinforcement. I imagine that we all have a denser learning history of responding to events in terms of other events that we're deeply familiar with or that are already meaningful in some way. When we try to interpret novelty through the lens of already established high mass networks, we're more successful than when we do otherwise. Thus, relational density theory is best described as an extension of RFT which can be described itself as an extension of Skinner's operant theory applied to relational framing. We've been busy in the lab um, trying to vet the various elements of this model and trying to search for anomalies that can expand the account. At first, this work was largely conceptual and basic, where we've seen research evolve and largely driven by the interests of students on this project is towards translational analyses that are necessary to build technologies that can be used on the ground by practitioners. We're trying to proceed cautiously and empirically, and if we're correct, then this work offers a view into the future of what technologies like ACT might do to support things like mental health. I want to walk through a series of two basic studies that I think are highly relevant before getting into applications here. The first is a study that we conducted on affective or emotional transfer of function as it occurs within these complex networks. Emotions, the way that we feel, are at the heart of our experience as verbal humans. And much of the work in research and mental health is meant specifically to tackle challenges and struggles of human emotions. So myself, Dr. Catrone, and doctoral students at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology have been attempting to understand these emotional experiences through a contextual lens and in terms of relational density. In the affective psychological literature and repeatedly in earlier translational density research, clustering of emotional experiences appears to show up along these common dimensions and are occurring consistently. Arousal functions are those that excite or inhibit action. High arousal do more, low arousal do less. Aversive functions make us avoid or escape situations. Appetitive functions make us approach situations. For example, fear is a high arousal negative emotional experience, whereas calm might be a low arousal positive experience. This account is deeply compatible with Skinner's account of positive and negative reinforcement and punishment. We act in ways to contact stimulation that is positively valenced and to avoid stimulation that is negatively balanced, which is why the ongoing act of feeling itself is so important, whether positively or negatively balanced. Feeling is what matters. And all of this occurs in a context. Language mirrors emotions. Like in Black Ledge's reinterpretation of Lang's fear network, where we see that in the context of taking an examination or a test, all of this language can show up and evoke avoidance of the exam 
in the form of procrastinating, perhaps even cheating on the exam and so on. On the other hand, language can also establish appetitive or positive excited emotions around the act of exam taking. The point is, either way, it's rooted in language around exam taking. From an RDT perspective, the question we might ask is which of these networks is the higher mass network operating in this context? From it, we might produce the behavior as it relates to exam taking. So for the study, um, we recruited 24 college student participants for the initial study, and we have another 82 participants in the sample to analyze. So these data that I'm going to show you here are based on this original sample. In phases one and two, we established six three-member classes to develop a complex 18-member network. The stimuli included faces depicting either happy or angry emotions, an arbitrary symbol, and an arbitrary word. In phase three, we attempted to merge some of the classes. In the coherence group, the merger was coherent, meaning the emotional valence of the merged stimuli were similar. In the incoherent group, the merger was not coherent, meaning the emotional valence of the merged stimuli were dissimilar. Then we developed an analysis of relational density to show the relational network in a geometric space using the multiple, using the multi-dimensional scaling procedure and then we tested the emotional valence of each stimuli using the semantic differential scale. So I'll show you what that looks like. The multidimensional scaling procedure was originally used to analyze relational patterns by Clayton and Linda Hayes in 2004. We used the arrangement from my study with Clayton in 2020, where participants were presented with pairwise images and asked to rate the relatedness of the images to one another on a 10 point scale, where 10 was most related and one was least related. By knowing the relationship of each stimulus to each other stimulus, a geospatial representation of the network can be achieved. The statistics borrow from Euclidean geometric logic that is way over my head. Um, in my world, it's hit the right buttons in the statistics program. Some magic happens more or less and you have a depiction of the relational networks. And we utilize the semantic differential scale that several Brazilian researchers, including in the study by Bartolucci and De Rossi, have been using in their research on meaningfulness and emotional stimuli. In this scale, you're presented with a stimulus and asked to compare between emotional adjectives. For example, is the word sec more angry or more happy, more tense or more relaxed. The negative selections are assigned a corresponding value, negative value, for example, negative two. And positive selections are assigned a corresponding positive value, like positive three. Now, in this study, the actual values and their negative and positive integers were not shown to the participants because these symbols themselves may already carry approach and avoidant functions. The stimulus pairing procedure that we use to establish the network um, looks something like this. We showed a first image followed closely in time by a second image followed by a blank screen. Then a next image was presented followed closely in time with its coordinated image followed by a blank screen. Altogether, we had six faces all female presenting to avoid gender as a confound, given our previous research showing relational differences along a gender binary. Faces were obtained from the Facial Emotion Recognition 2013 dataset, constructed with thousands of responses and augmented by AI technology. So we, we know from broad sample that these are perceived to be either happy or angry. These specific faces represent happy and angry. So classes one to three were positively balanced, whereas classes four through six were negatively balanced. The phases were paired with the following unfamiliar B stimuli that included wingdings that we've used in other studies. Um, after each stimulus pairing phase, we tested correct responding in a match to sample task, including A to B, B to C, a to C, C to B, 
as well as the merged relations, which we'll get to in a second. Participants showed mastery of the trained A to B relations, but not the derived transitive or equivalence relations, which makes sense given we have not yet introduced any of the C stimuli. Not a problem. So then we train those relations. In the testing phase, all of the relations popped, including the derived transitive and equivalence relations. To this point in the experiment, we know that we've established six three-member classes, more or less. Um, and therefore, we might assume the transfer of emotional functions through the network. So after we have A to B and B to C, the next phase was the coherence and incoherence merger, just like in the study that Clayton and I conducted. For the coherence group, B1 and B2 were paired. Both were positively balanced in our arrangement. And B3 and 4 were paired, both negatively balanced. For the incoherence group, B1 and B3 were paired that differed in their valence functions, and B2 and B4 were paired that also differed. The difference between the two groups, therefore, is that the merger was either centered around pre-existing valence emotions or relational coherence, whereas the other group um, was not. It's also important that our merger took place with the B stimuli that were only coherent or non-coherent based on their shared relationship with the A stimuli that carried the relational learning history, therefore showing a potential gravitational influence of this history on learning the relations. In the post-test, it should come as no surprise that percent accuracy was lower for the incoherence group compared to the coherence group, but what does this look like in the geospace? So let's start with the incoherence group. In this group, we loosely see the combination of two networks based on the valence functions and not the class merger. We see the classes one through three on the left and four through six on the right. Even the B stimuli um, that were merged remain distant from one another, showing resistance to change when that relation went against the previous relational learning history. We also included stimuli BX and BY that participated in our merger. These were paired with the remaining B3 and B6 stimuli respectively to balance our presentation. And here we see generally that BX was more positive than BY, um, but the space between them isn't that great. But what is interesting about the data from this group is that we do not necessarily see that A1 is closer to B1 or C1, which were directly paired, than they are to other B and C stimuli. It's as if the actual classes that we train did not necessarily hold, rather, it was the essence of positive and negative valence of the stimuli that organized the relational field. The specifics were lost, but what remained were the emotional valence of the stimuli that seemed to sort the network. All right, let's see the coherence group. Same general pattern or distribution, but significantly greater relational density and the same volume, therefore greater mass. The classes just collapse on themselves to create two clearly distinct networks. It's as if the great, it is as if the greater within class coherence or pre-experimental relatedness of the faces pulled in the other stimuli when the stimulus pairing was consistent with this history. Again, we introduced BX and BY, and again, BX was paired with B3 and BY with B6. For the coherence group, the stimuli emerged right in the center of our two networks. So the influence of our external context, in this case, stimulus pairing, was mediated by the relational mass of the class as would be predicted by our coherence function, as if the network was exerting gravity on, these, um, on each of these arbitrary stimuli. Here we have the semantic differential data between the two groups. So here's our transfer of emotional or affective function. First, we have the positively balanced A class, which were our faces. The faces carried the valence, so this outcome should not be surprising. We have the opposite effect for negatively valence faces as well. Um, what's interesting about this is that for five of six faces, greater valence in either positive or negative direction was observed for the coherence class. And so the happy faces were perceived as more positive for the coherence class and the negative faces were perceived, or sorry, the angry faces were perceived as more negative 
for the coherence class. So when we had relational coherence, the same faces were seen as a greater absolute value of emotional valence based on their relationships with arbitrary symbols and words. Um, we had the same general outcome for our B stimuli. And for our C stimuli, um, there was limited emotional transfer for the incoherence class. However, this transfer was retained for the coherence class. So in our coherence class, we see the emotions transferring from A to B and B to C. But for our incoherence class, we see some transfer from A to B and then a muted transfer as it relates to C. On the right, we have the absolute valence value. So we converted each to a positive number for comparison. And what we see is that the absolute values are greater for A, B, and C stimuli in the coherence networks. We also see greater transfer of positive versus negative affect altogether. This is consistent with the happiness superiority effect described by Bartolucci et al. in similar research and appears to be a consistent finding across our studies. We also see a reduction in the absolute value for both groups the further we get from the A stimulus, consistent with research on nodal distance, as well as the concept of relational volume. We also see that the difference between the coherence and incoherence group becomes greater the further we get from the A stimulus. And we lose that happiness superiority effect on C for the coherence group, which is also a potentially interesting outcome. I know. I was blown away too. Um, if, so if we're being behavior analysts or contextualists, relational framing is also influenced by external contingencies of reinforcement. We risk being mentalistic if we say that relational behavior causes over behaviors of interest or even our emotional experiences. The external context plays a central role in relational density theory and is expressed by X and negative X in our models. This next study was designed with Dr. Allison Stapleton and two of my students and colleagues to evaluate the effect of contingencies of reinforcement and punishment on rule governed behavior when rules were supported by low or high mass relational networks. So for this study, we recruited 24 college students. In phase one, they underwent relational training using a modified version of the stimulus pairing procedure that I showed you earlier. Uh, group one underwent coherent pairing and group two underwent incoherent pairing. Here were the pairs. The coherent group was coherent because the first two letters in the network were the same letter in either upper or lowercase form presumably established through a pre-experimental learning history that is incredibly dense and shared by the culture. So we assume that the participants are showing up to the experiment relating capital R to lowercase r and capital E to lowercase e. The other stimuli in the network were unfamiliar symbols. In phase two, we gave participants a rule to follow that required responding consistently with the relational classes by selecting the stimulus arrangement that contained the most images that were like an image presented at the top of the screen. In phase three, the contingency shifted such that following the rule no longer produced reinforcement and instead participants lost points and points were available for responding in the opposite way. We conducted MDS analyses on four occasions throughout the study to see how the relational field reacted to the contingencies of our program immediately before relational training, immediately after relational training, before the contingency shift, and after the contingency shift. So here's what they saw during the rule task. They were presented with a symbol at the top of the screen, for example, the letter E, and they were given the rule, choose the stimulus that is the most related. So in this case, this response has three stimuli that are contained within the relational network that includes this E stimulus. So the correct response required selecting the image that contained only class related stimuli. However, in the contingency shift, the exact same rule was presented and the exact same arrays were presented. It was unsignaled, so nothing in the environment would signal that the contingencies were changing. However, points were only awarded 
when they selected the least related stimulus in the array. And so here are our results in terms of percent accuracy. In the accurate rule phase, both groups responded approximately the same. We still need to look into response latencies, but for now, this is what we have. Responding was slightly more accurate for the coherence group, but not statistically significant. We see the greatest difference after the contingency shifted. The coherence group was able to more quickly adjust their responding and build to almost 50% accuracy in the final trial block. So we need to do a deeper analysis of what were the types of errors, and we're going to do that over the next few months before attempting to publish this work. So again, you guys are some of the first people to see these results. But the MDS results are really telling in this experiment. Here are the results at time one before relational training. These results make sense. We have two main clusters. We have letters on the left, unfamiliar stimuli on the right. The uppercase E is close to the lowercase E. The uppercase R is close to the lowercase R. The letters are clustered more densely given a greater history. So this is the higher mass network. And therefore we should expect that future framing patterns will organize around the letters rather than the letters organizing around the symbols. That's what makes this either coherent or incoherent. And this is exactly the result that we get at time two conducted right after relational training and before they experienced any contingencies at all. In the coherence group, we see it collapses into two clear networks organized by letter type. In the incoherence group, there is no clear organization. In fact, the same letters are still closer together, even though they were trained as being part of opposite networks, suggesting that this previous history was too great in mass and was highly resistant to change. And so again, consistent with our resistance equation. After experiencing the contingencies for responding in terms of the rule, select the one that is the most same. The coherence clusters are still high mass networks. Whereas we see some shuffling in the incoherence group, where finally the letters are starting to sort into their experimental categories, and so too are the symbols, but still nowhere near the mass of our coherence group. So the contingencies can move it, which is cool. Then after our contingency shift, we finally start to see a weakening of the coherence network, but the details matter. The density of the letter relations are still high. This part of the network remained resistant. However, the symbols that only recently joined the network are now in flux. On the other hand, the coherence network appears to have essentially rebounded to the pre-experimental relations. So did we just stumble on a phenomena that's already established in behavior momentum called resurgence? In the absence of reinforcement for relating to things in a new way, you respond in terms of prior relations that existed before the contingencies operated on it. So these results were not what we were expecting at all. We thought that the high density rule would be more resistant to the contingency shift. Instead, it was as if the high mass group was actually more flexible to the shift. I think there's a clear reason why though, and we might have also accidentally stumbled across a sort of relational entanglement that is showing up in other studies as well. So let's break this down a little bit more. Um, remember this equation. So let's treat our response as if it's a network. This makes sense given networks are comprised of relational responses. If the two networks um, are of the same mass, then there's an equal probability that responding will occur in either network A or B. Well, we can weight this outcome by either increasing the mass of network A, like in our coherence condition, and reinforcing responding in terms of A, like in our contingency shift, something like this. Now, when the contingencies flip, it should be more difficult to make the shift for the high mass coherence group, at least in theory, but that's not what happened. But consider that in this case, responding in terms of network B is actually the opposite of A. Remember, the, reinf the reinforced contingency shift was to select the least related instead of the most related. So what's being reinforced is to do the opposite. So when we increase the relational mass of A, we're also increasing the relational mass of B because B exists as the opposite of A. So here's where things get tricky. As the new contingency pulls the response closer to B, 
And if B is also a high mass network that is the opposite of A, then once R hits a threshold, it should rapidly accelerate towards B, producing an even more flexible response. Essentially, we should expect that the person might be able to switch rapidly between networks A and B, depending on the context. This is actually incredibly important. Without considering the mass of other networks, it would be tempting to assume that the more you know about something, the more resistant it is to change. But when those things are related or entangled in other ways, it might actually make relational responding even more flexible. So how do we foster flexible responding? Establish multiple relations that operate in multiple and complex ways. Essentially, building relational repertoires that are highly adaptive in context or psychologically flexible. So this is why this outcome, which we were not expecting, but what we're seeing in terms of things like emotional experiences as well, is so critically important as we start to approach challenges related to mental health. Flexibility matters, and our initial conceptualization of what that might be from a density perspective was wrong and requires understanding entanglement to some extent, which we're still unpacking. So a common question that we get is why do we have all of these equations? Why is there a need for a theory extension like RDT? Well, RFT is often described narratively or in a technical notation. This works fine when relational networks are relatively small and the dimensions are limited to only a few CREL's. This notation here is a three member network in one singular context. However, what happens when we build to 18 stimuli that are related across multiple dimensions? The notation would take up the whole screen and it would be impossible to interpret. And although it's predicted entailments may be logical to a computer that can hold all of this information, our experiments show that the exact relations may not hold at this level of complexity. And it is more so these higher order patterns or the essence of the relational responding that remains at complexity. Critchfield and Reed discuss the importance of quantitative models in the field of behavior analysis for researchers at all levels. First, it provides a parsimonious shorthand. Once the equation is understood by the community, it can itself convey meaning without the need for excessive narrative description. For example, uh, let's say you're treating clients experiencing depression or anxiety. We might find that unworkable or self-defeating rules are highly resistant to change. How do we know? Well, because it's pervasive, it occurs across multiple contexts. At some level, even the concept of psychopathology necessitates a level of stability or unworkability, maladaptive behavior that we know for humans who relationally frame likely necessitates equally rigid rule following that's maladaptive or unworkable. Therefore, one solution given this equation is to simply increase the force of negative x or to change exposure to contingencies that might challenge the rule. For example, in behavioral activation that involves approaching previously or potentially appetitive, aversive experiences, even though doing so is hard. When we do this, we're increasing negative x as it relates to our unworkable rule in hopes that these contingencies hook the behavior more than the relational network. Things like exposure therapy, system, uh, systematic desensitization, and so on, are built to shape tolerance that can allow for even greater magnitudes of negative X over time. This was developed by behavior analysts and is huge within acceptance and commitment therapy. Now, we don't just want to expose the environment without teaching adaptive alternatives. We want to build relational repertoires that can compete with the unworkable rule and be responded to flexibly. If not the unworkable rule, then what else do we want our clients to do? Remember the entanglement or opposition result from the rule governed behavior study. Psychological flexibility likely necessitates the ability to move through multiple adaptive relational repertoires in a context in order to maximize contact with valued sources of reinforcement. So if we simultaneously introduce clients to a contingency shift through behavioral activation while building an alternative relational network that is coached up in that context, now we're getting somewhere. And we want more flexible rules to be more resistant to change, such as given the passage of time 
or when challenges show up in new contexts and the therapist is not around, we want those flexible rules to persist despite those disruptors. How do we do it? Well, let's increase volume. Multiple exemplar training, get out in the world, get out in the context, experience new challenges. What about density? Train to fluency, practice, 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 over and over again. When we increase volume and density within our ACT sessions, we might be able to create more flexible repertoires of flexibility or psychological flexibility that's also more resistant than the rules that led to psychological suffering in the first place. I know that this is quite abstract, um, but I'll unpack it a bit more in a bit. Another question is, can we weaken the control exerted by the unworkable rule or make that unworkable rule less resistant to change? If so, not only will negative X, our contingency shift, be more effective, but the probability of responding in terms of psychological flexible networks that we're building in therapy can be more effective too. We can transform our equation as relational density is equal to mass over volume. Well, if we increase volume in incoherent ways, holding mass constant or reducing it, then we might see less pull from the rule. How might we increase volume? Well, diffusion is an example. The very essence of most diffusion activities involves working with the thought in multiple and incompatible ways. Let's sing the thought as a birthday song, say it over and over again, draw it as a thought monster. And when we do that, we might see that density diminishes. The environment can then exert more present moment influence. In a sense, we're making space for, in a more literal sense, for things like present moment awareness to occur. Of course, all of this is interdependent fields operating in a context of X or force and negative X counterforce, influencing all elements of the field as the external contingencies ebb and flow. And these higher order relations are incredibly hard to describe narratively. This is the whole point. Um, their meaning, sorry. They're hard to describe narratively. Um, their meaning is hard to discern as something literal, but becomes more literal, literal when we zoom out and look at the big picture. In general, our standard equations like those that I've shown here. Um, such as the idea that relational frames might exert something similar to gravity in Newtonian mechanics. I mean, it sounds insane, um, and it's all good and well as far as a metaphor is concerned, but what do we do with this information beyond feeling in awe and perhaps a bit of dread at the immense complexity of human relational responding? Well, let's break it down quantitatively, again, in a general equation that allows us to start to play with the elements. So what is force? Attraction is a change that exceeds the context. For example, if I have two networks that I'm trying to merge with a third network and it takes way more resources to get the second network to merge than it does the first, then we would say that the attraction between the first and the third has greater force because less external force or context is needed to merge the networks. Okay. So let's say in therapy, you're doing an exercise that's not landing with your client. Something like leaves on a stream. Well, what's going on? Two things could be true based on our equation. First, maybe the mass of leaves on the stream metaphor as a network is too low. Maybe the person grew up in an exclusive existence in a big city and has never watched a leaf drift on a stream. It has limited meaning to them. Okay, no problem. Uh, let's switch it maybe to an airplane as a metaphor since they live near an airport. Imagine attaching your thoughts to an airplane and watching them take off into the sky. Don't worry about where they're going. Uh, you know, that thought too, you can attach it to an airplane and watch it take off as well. Watch it fly away and keep doing this as you notice another thought show up. Another challenge might be that the distance between our metaphor network and the challenge that they're actually experiencing is too far of a leap. You're trying to use leaves on a stream to help resolve that your client just got fired from their job. Now notice that thought, I cannot pay my rent and watch it drift away on a leaf. That's all good and well until they get kicked out of their home. The distance is too great between our leaf metaphor and the actual challenge, but maybe something like a values network is closer that can start to bridge the gap. 
Now, I get the limitations of Newtonian mechanics in the physical sciences, it's a starting point. Yet from it, uh, we might be able to, you know, or sorry, from Newtonian mechanics, scientists and engineers have been able to build bridges and airplanes and all of those things. So from a pragmatic lens, Newton is still very much the man, unless you're deep in space time or chilling like Ant-Man in the quantum realm. Also, if we want to get to how networks evolve quantitatively and not just narratively, then we need units to start to build network analyses. In this case, volumetric mass density could provide us with a starting point. And at its core, the essence of all experiences may be self. Skinner defines self as the central organization of all responses and the entire learning history of an individual. In ACT, self is fundamental to interventions across a myriad of psychological challenges. It's really hard to explain the concept of self. Um, if anyone's familiar with the chessboard metaphor, the point of it is that you are none of the pieces on the chessboard. Um, rather, you are the chessboard and the pieces and the entirety of that experience. Uh, uh, that experience. The point is, is that the metaphor is meant to convey the transcendence of self the essence of observing and noticing one's thoughts and feelings beyond its context or elements, all of it mediated through symbols and meaning. So I'm going to do a really quick activity and, and maybe I can get, you know, one or two responses and if people could throw some stuff in the chat, that would be great. I've given you a lot of content, so I want to pause to see if we can apply these concepts and get a bit of participation. So here we have a client who's struggling with gambling and says that they are losing everything. Their spouse wants them to stop, but is unwilling to say anything to them about it and says that's just the way they are. I'm stuck in this too. The client also wants to stop, but seems to be fused to a rule. Everyone has their vices. This is mine. I'm only going to gamble this week to get it out of my system. And then next week I'm going to quit. Of course, as next week never comes. So this is a behavior analysis problem in many ways. We have clear contingencies of reinforcement, uh, several potential functions. We have behavior we can observe and measure. There are clearly rules within nested layers of dense relations that we need to unpack. So in this scenario, I want to focus on this specific rule. Everyone has their vices. This is mine. I'm only going to gamble this week to get it out of my system. And then next week, I'm going to quit. So of course we could break this down into a network analysis if we want, um, but I want to see if we can start to use this density thing to guide a case conceptualization. So my first question, if you want to try to answer it in the chat, is how could we increase counterforce or external contingencies in order to change the behavior? And I'd love to hear from one or two people from the audience too. So how could we manipulate negative X or counterforce that's operating on this rule? So Maria is saying new, new activities, activities with, 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 without, without asking, asking him to stop. OK, great. Yeah, what other what other repertoires or activities are available other than gambling for him to engage in? And what are the contingencies of reinforcement that operate on those alternative responses? Good. Yeah, we're increasing X for the alternative activities. Mm -hmm. DRA style, love it. What's one more example? Okay, make it harder to an increase in response effort of gambling. Increase the response effort of gambling itself. Yeah, perfect. Absolutely. Maybe there's a set amount of money that is set aside and he has to engage in some kind of additional behavior in order to access the gambling money. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a perfect example of throwing in a disruptor. It's not perfect, but it could disrupt the process. And what about what about um, his spouse? They seem to be enabling it as well. Um, and so is there an element of adjusting their behavior um, to also serve as a bit of a disruptor? They seem to be passively OK with it. 
um, but we're not sure how long that will last. OK, next question. Um, how could we decrease mass or resistance to change of their rule? So they gave you this rule. They believe it to be true. Um, it's high mass. How could we uh, decrease its mass? Through some diffusion exercise, I guess you could just uh, notice uh, I'm having the thought that whatever or see what I yep. I do. Yeah, exactly. So we could, you know, create a diffusion exercise that increases the volume. Um, and if we're doing it in a non coherent way, then it should not add to our density or mass. And so we can maybe reduce the influence of that specific rule. Awesome, good. OK, and then the last question is, how might we build a competing relational network or rule that has more mass? And I'll, I'll jump in on this one just in the interest of time. One example that I think of is maybe we build the values network to have greater mass as something that could compete. And so I'm at the casino. I'm thinking about how I'm getting this out of my system. All of my relational framing is really based on that negative reinforcement contingency. How am I going to feel OK later? But what if I can get those values to show up psychologically in the moment at the point of gambling? What if I can think about my wife, my kids, if I can think about um, that I'm spending my kids educational money or college tuition at the casino today and that my wife is going to leave me if I keep doing this. If I can get that stuff to start to show up at the moment of gambling and also then those appetitive functions as well, um, starting to think about how my life will be different if I can just walk away right now and bring those contingencies into the psychological present. So we want to build math, uh, volume and density and practice it in session so that when we're at the point of uh, of playing the slot machine that those events are showing up psychologically or even before that at the point of choosing where to spend the day. So it's not perfect um, by any means, but it's a starting point of how we're trying to take this relational density theory stuff and apply it to case conceptualization to deal with mental health. We're at a starting point. We very recently published a clinical case study where we used uh, density theory as a conceptual framework to develop an intervention. I want to walk through the study really uh, quickly, but it kind of shows how we're operating this framework. So this study was implemented with a young adult male um, diagnosed with autism, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. They had high scores on the peak comprehensive assessment that indicated that they had a strong relational repertoire. They were attending a specialized school. They had high rates of aggressive behavior and therefore had difficulties getting accepted into a residential facility. They were currently living with their mom, but expressed a value of being more independent and eventually moving out of their home. And so in this study, um, we did a series of assessments. We did an open ended functional assessment interview, questions about behavior function, child psychological flexibility questionnaire and the avoidance infusion questionnaire. So I put these in here only because they're fairly standard assessments that we already use. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. What are these assessments getting at from a density analysis? Well, the FAI and the QABF are giving us information about X and negative X. What are the external contingencies that might maintain the external and relational behaviors that are challenging as well as maintain the external uh, or sorry the relational behaviors that participate with them. The child psychological flexibility questionnaire and the avoidance and fusion questionnaire give us some information about relational mass. So how resistant are the flexibility and inflexibility networks going to be to change? And if we view it this way, let's attack both. So we can attack negative X, for example, by creating contingency contracting. 
So in this case, uh, the participant earned access to their community to support greater autonomy in a stepwise fashion as they met conditions in their contingency contract and as points were earned throughout the day, um, both for uh, external behavior as well as identifying act processes within their own behavior at the end of the day. Then we can target relational mass, for example, doing twice weekly act lessons guided by the AIM curriculum. And these were delivered over telehealth by, uh, by very highly trained RBTs and equally targeted all six of the core processes of the ACT Hexaflex. In addition, in order to create more relational mass, all elements of the intervention, including the contingency contract, as well as the ACT lessons were Star Wars themed. He was a huge Star Wars fan. Um, towards moves were the light side of the force, away moves were the dark side of the force, Positive and negative feelings are both okay, but we cannot give in to anger and hate and become aggressive. We simply have to notice it, sit with it, identify our values and move towards the light side of the force in the moment. One example of a themed aim lesson involved using the force to lift an X-wing out of a swamp on Dagobah. Committed actions were the force, and he had to come up with several alternative examples of committed action at a fluent enough rate to get the ship out of the swamp. Adding this component was to support greater coherence between the experiences in the AIM lessons and Star Wars, which was already a high mass, positively balanced relational network. And the results are what you see in the behavior analysis studies. So as far as uh, percentage of school day in which he was aggressive, we see that was around 23% of the day in baseline and reduced to around 11% in the intervention phase. The results were maintained at one month and one year follow ups. When he was aggressive, uh, the total duration and minutes of his most severe aggressive episode of the week decreased. So it's not just that his overall frequency of aggression went down, um, but when an intensive episode did occur, the episode was less intense. And we see reductions in psychological inflexibility over time. So we can infer that the relational networks that occurred along with aggressive behavior were reduced in mass that allowed the other elements of the intervention, such as our contingency contract, as well as the naturally occurring contingencies to become more powerful in the environment to exert more influence. What's more important is that because of this intervention, he was accepted into a residential facility um, to support his independence and autonomy um, where he was living during the one year follow-up and is still living today. The next data set that I want to show you um, is that we're trying to figure out how to assess these processes more directly from a density model. So instead of just reinterpreting our current frameworks, how can we start to invent new technologies that can operate in these spaces? So this study was conducted by Dr. Palalunas and her lab recently evaluating the role of relational responding in the psychological flexibility of college students. So they recruited 30 uh, undergrads and sorted the students into high and low flexibility groups based on their scores on the personalized psychological flexibility index in the context of um, an educational goal. Relational responding was measured again using the multidimensional scaling procedure similar to those that you've seen so far. The participants generated some of their own stimuli, including values, strengths and interests and challenges and thoughts and feelings that they have in that context. And we also gave them preset stimuli that included six positive and negative affect terms from the PANAS. And we also included the didactic stimulus, me, here, now. And so the results are pretty telling. For the low flexibility group, um, what we see is that me, here, now, is closely related to the negative affect network stimuli, as well as my challenges and my problem behaviors, and tightly fused to my emotions and thoughts. In the high flexibility group, we see the opposite. Me here now is more closely related to the positive affect network and is closely related to my educational goals, strengths, and interests, and less related to my emotions and thoughts even though my emotions and thoughts are also drifting closer to the positive network. In any case, what these data suggest are that there are higher order relational patterns within the relational field that participate in the concept of psychological flexibility 
that plays an important role in our act based intervention. So I know that I'm running short on time. We have five minutes left, but I want to make sure that I take a moment to address something that I believe is immensely important when we're talking about mental health from a behavior analytic lens. Relational density theory provides a theoretical framework to understand relational behavior in an interdependent way that operates in a context. But it's important to understand that this context also itself operates in a context. Cultural contingencies or meta contingencies create the conditions in which um, the contextual contingencies operate on each individual. The contingencies of reinforcement and punishment that lead to poor mental health themselves operate within larger and more extended cultural contingencies. And we live in a culture that experiences exceptionally poor mental health outcomes. Research on adverse childhood experience tells us that living in a world that limits punishment and maximizes reinforcement with respect for childhood development can reduce or even eliminate many of the social and mental challenges that we face today. And yet poverty and violence persist in our society today and coercion abounds as the primary mode of altering human behavior. Moreover, meaning emerges from within cultural contingencies propagated through language pervasive in the very ways we've been taught to view our world. That the way that things are today ought to be so. The idea that it is what it is. But for many, what it is is suffering. And for some more than others. The only way to truly support mental health on a broad scale is to work towards what Tony Biglin described as a more nurturing society, more nurturing communities. And that requires expanding this science to a next level that goes beyond these immediate contingencies that we all face. Now, this stuff has been around for a while, but as noted by Haman Farr and Rodriguez, there is substantial agreement among behavior analysts that cultural practices are conditioned by social or verbal influence. That is to say, not only the external contingencies operate on a group that influence the group, but there are long-standing symbolically mediated traditions or a cultural milieu that includes things like shared beliefs, morals, material resources, competition, governance, government, policies, and so on. The cultural milieu is the very essence of the culture itself. In our terms, the milieu can be understood as the relational mass operating at a cultural level comprised of the relational behavior of many behaving people within complex systems. The history of behavior analysis doesn't start with Skinner. There's a depth of intellectual thought that precedes Skinner upon which the initial conditions of behavior analysis were formed. Behavior analysis is one of many um, subgroups developed from American pragmatism. The central argument is that we cannot know the truth and science is wasting its time attempting to do so. The search for some greater truth beyond experience has led to more suffering than it has good. Instead, we should seek out scientific principles that allow us to work better in our worlds today than yesterday and better tomorrow than today. But note better is idealized in the sense that we will never achieve it. We will never achieve best, only better. Also, what is best is both contextual and culturally defined. Sadly, what is considered best for the ruling class is what is generally taken as best by the broader society and with disastrous implications for minority groups. Given the emphasis on context, um, American is used here to denote that this particular brand of pragmatism arrived at and is embodied in the Americas. Spencer notes that the concept of pragmatism is deeply enmeshed within many indigenous belief structures, emphasizing the role of context and generation in the selection of behavior, the propagation of ideas through symbols, James and Pierce are, you know, given credit for this, um, but from pragmatism is the idea of philosophical doubt. We should question the dogmatic rules that were given as truths, test those truths, examine their ability to change the world in some way. In the United States, it should come as no surprise that these essential or elemental truths came mostly from religious doctrines that, as it happens, largely benefited white people and men and led to the oppression of women and people of color. Born from pragmatic thought were the waves of feminism that challenged the social construction of womanhood and the pragmatic utility of oppressing just over half of the population. Is this beneficial? Uh, to things like critical race theory that posited that racism is rooted deeply within our shared historical context. 
And although we cannot change this history, we can act now to influence its future. So in this way, pragmatism can be viewed as the opposite of colonialism. Colonialism, the act of acquiring full or partial control of territory, enacting policies and exploiting its people economically. Exceptionalism, the belief that our culture knows best. In some ways, what we're learning in our translational research on RDT can contribute to a pragmatic understanding of complex relational behavior as it exists within cultural contexts. Ideally, this should be focused on dismantling colonialism and contributing to these mental health challenges in our world. Um, so there's a lot more to go through and not a lot of time. Um, I know we have some questions, so I'm going to get out of the way, but I want to leave you with this. So as a field, what is our meaning and what is our essence? What is our cultural milieu? What are the dense, voluminous, multiply related networks that influence our behavior as clinicians and scientists? For Skinner, meaning and understanding were at the heart of self and self-control. Here now, we have the ability to control our own futures and to define our own meaning. Some of you may choose to be amazing clinicians and save the world one person at a time. Do that. Some of you might choose to become fantastic researcher scientists discovering deep truths about the human condition. Do it. Determine what all of this means to you and your history and what this information that you've learned today might mean for your work tomorrow. And deep down as a field, what is our essence as behavior analysts, as behavior scientists? Well, let's choose to be essentially good, to be progressive, to be affirming and not denying of experiences, to be pragmatic and to put the needs of society, especially of those most harmed by it, at the forefront of our research. There's nothing wrong with them. Mental health is not a, uh, does not signify um, some deficiency of the individual, it signifies a deficiency of the society that surrounds them. We need to change it. Let us choose to be essentially human to start and achieving our desired meaning and purpose in the world will follow. Thank you. Thank you so very much for this talk. This was really, really good. I guess we we should move on to the next link and have the panel discussion now in the new link there, right? So I'm just going to shut down this call.